Welcome back to Dark Souls 2. We're in uh, Lost Bastille again uh, to finish up in Belfry Luna. We finished Belfry Soul a couple of episodes ago. This is the corresponding part uh, in the Lost Bastille. So before you come here, um, you need a Pharaoh's Lockstone. Make sure you've got some kind of ranged weapon. Throwing knives, crossbow, bow um, for the boss in here. And uh, you might want to be unplugged for the internet before you come out here because uh, you can be invaded once you enter Belfry Luna by humans. Um, so we've got a puppet in here. Just like Belfry Soul. And I'm going to talk over him because it's the same kind of dialogue. Mocking, sarcastic. Um, I've been thinking about these puppets and uh, the first time that we encounter any kind of... Um, puppet or um, artificial life um, for certain is in Mythos territory when we encounter the the mannequins and um, it's made me wonder whether Mytha has anything to do with these puppets especially since these puppets have got a sarcastic demeanour and mannerism about them their dialogue's definitely uh, very mocking um, especially in relation to the prince and the princess forever for true it doesn't sound um, like it's heartfelt or true to the love that these two people had for each other. It sounds um, sarcastic and mean-spirited. So yeah, I definitely think Mitha is the one that made these puppets, uh, or marionettes or whatever they're called, um, and placed them here and in Belfry Soul. Um, we'll talk about that a wee bit later on. First of all, if you come down here, you can pick up quite a useless ring. It's the Blue Tearstone Ring, which confers a defensive bonus on your character when he gets below a certain uh, amount of health. The Red Tearstone Ring is much more valuable, and uh, we'll pick that up a bit later on, um, in Shaded Woods, actually. So these uh, Bell Keepers are just like the ones from uh, Belfry Soul. Uh, you'll be invaded by an NPC instead of a human. And um, these ones do, I'm sure it's dark magic damage instead of like a uh, fire damage, like the Bell Keepers and Belfry Soul. Um, and the actual um, invader, the Bell Keeper, has a chance to drop a, a large Titanite shard. Um, so if you're lucky, you might get that off him when you kill him. I think he has a wee bit more health than the, the normal Bell Keepers, but these Bell Keepers aren't difficult. Um, when you come up this ladder, you're going to there's going to be one that that comes straight for you. And um, just be aggressive with them. Just try and get as much damage in as quickly as possible against them. Two hand your weapon. Um, I definitely prefer Belfry Soul for its atmosphere. Um, it seems more hopeful. Um, this place seems forsaken, abandoned, dark, nasty, horrible. Um, what have we got in here? I can't even remember actually. Okay, so Radiant Life Gems, they can actually be very useful for the boss fight that's coming up. Let me talk about that boss fight actually because there's not going to be much time to prepare for it. You want to, on one hand, you want to kind of have high defence, physical defence and maybe some fire defence as well. It's a familiar enemy, even one that you've encountered in Dark Souls 1. And uh, I believe that ringing this bell actually alerts the, the boss that we're going to encounter in a minute to your presence. Um, again, maybe the, the boss here was placed here by Mitha. Um, so yeah, you want to two-hand your weapon when you get into the boss room because you want to do as much damage as quickly as possible to the, the enemies in the boss room. Um, on one hand, like I was saying, you want to be tanked up to have high defence, but on the other hand, you want to be light enough that your stamina regen is going to come back quickly enough, and you're going to um, roll far, kind of roll further. And uh, the breakpoints work out. Use an aromatic ooze as well, and make sure you've got a ranged weapon on your bar, like throwing knives, or you want to have your crossbow in your your offhand or something like that. And um, the way that this works is, it's the Belfry gargoyles from Dark Souls One. They're a bit different. And you're going to have to fight five of them, I think it is. And they all spawn in at different times. The second one spawns in three seconds after you come through the fog gate. What you want to do as well is, this is very important, concentrate on one gargoyle at a time. And concentrate on the gargoyle that you're actually doing damage to. Because you want to finish that gargoyle off as quickly as possible. 
So let me talk about the the strategy. Two hand your weapon, do as much damage as possible. I'm doing this incorrectly. The way I'm doing this on screen is incorrect. Use radiant life gems because they're faster than Estus flasks. And um, let me tell you the way that they spawn in first. As you walk through the door, three, the second three seconds after, the third after 90% of the total health bar. Uh, so 90, so t after you've done 10% damage to the total health bar, uh, the fourth at 70% total health for the entire boss fight, and the fifth at 50%. So that's why you want to concentrate on one at a time and uh, kill the one off you're doing damage to as quickly as possible. Uh, the most annoying move that they have is the one when they jump up and go behind you and try and backstab you. And uh, they can be quite annoying as well when you're trying to get close to them and just as you're about to hit them, they fly off or jump up in the air or whatever. And that's why you want to have a ranged weapon as well so that you can do damage to them across the screen. Um, so yeah, in, in the, I'm just going to talk quickly about the Undead Purgatory fight. I mentioned something about 60% being the kind of target you want to for your equip load. Um, but really it's actually 50, below 50% because once you get to below 50% your stamina regens much quicker. You can roll further and whatnot. Um, I know that everyone knows that the breakpoint for fast roll and fat roll is 70% and I said 60% in the last video but really um, try and keep below 50% while at the same time not sacrificing your physical defense or your defenses. Uh, to elemental damage and physical attack. But as you can see, it's not really that difficult a boss fight. And because it's familiar as well, you already kind of have a strategy in mind for how this, this fight works. And um, as soon as this uh, gargoyle went for his fire breath, um, I thought the fight was over there, but nope, it's this one coming up. And he kind of kicked my ass a wee bit towards the end here. They're a wee bit different from the ones in Dark Souls 1. Um, for a start, they look darker and... I don't know, maybe it's just the way that I've got the graphics set up, but they kind of... I know they're supposed to be stone, but they kind of look a wee bit metallic. Um, I put the Silver Serpent Ring on here so we could get more souls. And it's the first time I think I succeeded in doing that in Dark Souls 2. Just find it more tricky in this game to do that. Um, I apologise for speaking quickly, but I'm trying to get as much information in a um, short space of time. So if you read the description for the the Belfry Gargoyles, it says um, brought to uh, mysteriously came to life. I don't think it's mysterious. I think it's the fact that we rang the bell. The covetous demon. I was reading this, I don't know if I showed it to you before, but I think the description suggests that there was a man that was in love with Mitha, and just like Mitha was um, rejected by the old Iron King, I think there was a person, a man, that had feelings for uh, Mitha, and she likewise rejected him, because she obviously loved the old Iron King, and that in facing that rejection, facing up to that rejection, this person um, became covetous of, uh, or became greedy or something like that, and became this big Jabba the Hutt creature. Southern Ritual Band. I think that increases attunement slots. Um, I might be wrong about that. I, I should have done my research before and checked that out. I must have missed it when I was going through the video. I'll put a description uh, down below um, to regards to what it does. Uh, I know one of the Ritual Bands increases attunement slots, I think. Um, this is another homage to Dark Souls 1, and uh, this is obviously a homage to the Capra Demon fight with the dogs. And we're going to be invaded by uh, Vorgo the Sinner, and uh, that makes sense that he's a sinner since we're in a prison, uh, the Lost Bastille. Um, and he seems to be protecting the Bastille Key, which is on that corpse uh, behind him. This guy has no poise. Um, he's like one of those undead infantry soldiers from the Forest of Fallen Giants. Very easy. Um, I love the sound effect you get when you get the repost animation. 
And uh, interestingly, the Bastille key describes, it's got a strange description, it suggests that the person that built the Lost Bastille, the Bastille Lord it claims, that was a useful, useless item we picked up there. Um, but it says the Bastille Lord built the prison in order to keep the undead locked away here. Yet, at the final paragraph it says, the entire Bastille was turned into a prison and left abandoned to rot with its prisoners. Which doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, because if you make a prison, if you construct a prison, you don't want to let it rot and become um, derelict, because um, it increases the risk of the prisoners, the people that you built it for, escaping. <laughs> So it suggests to me that either the Bastille Lord died, went hollow, or was a bit mad to begin with, and forgot what the, the purpose of his prison was for. Uh, in the next episode, we'll definitely go to the Shaded Woods, I'm pretty sure of that. And uh, thanks for watching, hope it helped.